Okay, President O'Brien, we are now uh, broadcasting. Good evening, everyone. I will um, call the governing board meeting to order at 7 p.m. Roll call will reflect that all governing board members are present. And if you'd all please stand for our pledge of the Pledge of Allegiance and a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. A motion to adopt the agenda, please. I move that we adopt the agenda as reads. Second. I second. We have a motion and a second to adopt the agenda as presented. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any nays? Hearing no nays, the um, agenda has been adopted unanimously. We'll uh, start with our old business this evening. I have a motion for um, the 22-23 district calendar, please. I move that the governing board, well, we need to pick a letter first. Um, how would you like me to proceed with that? Um, I, why don't we start with A? That's what I was going to go for. So I would make a motion that the governing board approve calendar A 2022-2023 district calendar. I second. Thank you. We have a first and a second. Um, do we have a, um, a review of any material, Mrs. Myers? Is she still here with us? No, I'm just here to answer any questions if you would possibly have any. Thank you so much as, um, with, for continuing to be with us this evening, Ms. Meyer. Do you board members have any um, questions? I don't have a question, just a comment. Go ahead, Mrs. Reed. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to the calendar committee for um, doing the due diligence and putting together um, viable options for us and um, for getting feedback from the community. And then just wanted to say thank you for um, the community members who weighed in on um, their decisions. I know that there were several different groups um, on social media and that I was tagged in that had different thoughts. So um, just thank you. I, I saw those and took your comments into consideration. Thank you, Mrs. Reed. Is there any discussion on Either of the calendars? Seeing no discussion, I will Ms. Mrs. O'Brien, just real quick, I did want to say that um, the, the effort and energy that was put into um, giving us two options um, is much appreciated. And I, I know that um, we... Uh, do this a lot with the, the calendars, but I think this year out of maybe Karen, all of your years, uh, this might have been a very pivotal um, uh, year to do the calendars. So uh, we're now voting on option A, correct, Mrs. O'Brien? Correct, option A. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, please say nay. Hearing no nays, the motion passes unanimously to adopt calendar A for, dis for uh, the 2022-23 district calendar. Thank you so much, um, Mrs. Meyer, for all your work and for staying with us this evening. All right, district reports. We are going to start with the fiscal year 22 um, budget committee report. So that means we'll be getting to hear from Mrs. Mock.
Good evening, President Ordway, members of the board and guests watching online. I'm pleased to present the FY22 budget committee recommendation uh, in partnership with uh, committee co-chair, Mr. Jim Migliorino. Um, this is only my second year as co-chair for this committee, but this was uh, just a fantastic year for participation all the way around from our community, uh, from our committee members and responses to our surveys as we'll talk about in, uh, in a slide or two. Gary, can you go ahead to the next slide? This committee has various stakeholders and they are charged with developing a recommendation of budget priorities for the next school year. Typically, there are three meetings for the committee. This year we met December 2nd, January 6th, and February 3rd. For the meeting on December 2nd, we actually start with a uh, preview of School Finance 101. We move to some more specific district budget information on January 6th, as well as reviewing survey information. And on February 3rd, we finalize the uh, budget priority recommendations. Uh, we had a very full committee this year. We had great participation. You can see the names of all the committee members here. Some of them may be with us online and I want to thank them all personally. We had great attendance at every meeting. I don't know if it's because we were able to do it digitally instead of here in person. And maybe that made it a little easier for committee members to join us. And uh, so each me committee meeting, we had approximately 18 people in attendance um, and, and they were active participation. They had homework in between times reviewing survey data and they just did a fantastic job. Uh, Gary, go ahead and go to the next slide. I think that's out of order, that's okay. Oh, this was, go. okay, go ahead, I know where we are now. Sorry, that's not the same necessarily as what I have in front of me, so I apologize. Um, these were, yeah. Go ahead and go to the next one. That's a, a little misleading. Um, go ahead. Gary, go up just. Sorry, it's hard when you're not seeing what you expect and you don't have the clicker, so I apologize. Um, I'm gonna review just a little more about the committee work before we get into this data. We had best laid plans. So, um, the committee met for the first time on December 2nd. Before the committee met, we actually launched a narrative survey. On November 30th, we launched the narrative survey to all of our stakeholders, to our parents, teachers, staff members, community, business partners. And the narrative survey allows each individual responding to provide their top budget priority for the next school year. We received a, uh, about 2,600, a little more than 2,600 responses which was nearly a thousand more responses than we had received for the budget uh, narrative input survey last year. Following that, we had that information just in time for the January 6th meeting. We actually sent it to the committee members to look at some of the data over winter break and some folks that really very thoughtfully looked at all of the responses. Uh, we're looking for um, all of the um, items, the responses that have the greatest frequency of response. Uh, Dr. Scott Smith from our data analysis department helped us administer the survey and gather some of the results as well. He typically will take those responses and give us the initial uh, data as well. Um, right when we came back from winter break on January 6th, we had our second meeting. So everyone brought their homework with them. We took a look at those responses. At that meeting, we actually looked more at Deer Valley's specific budget um, for the current year and some very loose projection for next year. Um, the main elements of the first meeting in December and the meeting in January really set the pretense for the overall budget committee. Uh, while we have nearly endless wants and needs for our students and our teachers and our staff, certainly our budget is not uh, does not follow that same curve as our wants and needs. And so this committee's work is very important to make sure that we're responsive to those things that our stakeholders need the most in the coming school year. February 3rd was the meeting following the closing of the forced ranking survey. So on January 6th, we developed the forced ranking survey with the committee where we uh, found the, I think it was approximately 10 
most frequent responses from the narrative survey. We sent that out and ask our stakeholders to then rank in order of importance their top five budget priorities for the next school year. I am very pleased to say that when that survey was open from January 19th to January 29th, we received an astounding 4,400 responses. Uh, our communications department, I would like to thank them for helping us get the survey link out to all of our stakeholders. And I know we would not have been able to get all of those responses without them. So what you're going to see next are some of the uh, results from that forced ranking survey that have gotten us to um, the recommendations that you're going to hear tonight from the committee. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Migliorino. <laughs> uh, good evening, uh, President O'Brien, members of the board, Dr. Finch. Uh, so the, uh, as Ms. Mock shared, uh, two surveys as part of this process uh, that we've been doing now for um, several years now. Uh, this, these are the results of the, that first, uh, what we refer to as the survey. Uh, Ms. Mock mentioned that we had over a thousand more responses. So you can see uh, 2,637 responses, almost 1,600 of those responses are from parents. Um, and we have a, a category of parents as well as a category that uh, is uh, parent and staff member, uh, if they may be in dual role. Um, from those responses, um, competitive salaries, additional academic supports, increase uh, salary increase for all employees, teacher salaries, reduced class size, and enhanced programs were some of the more frequent responses that we received. And on the next slide, um, this is, these are the responses from the forced ranking survey. This is the second um, survey that we send out. This actually has prescribed priorities from the committee input, uh, which is derived from the input from that first survey, plus uh, all the additional information that we share with the committee members. And really hard to see, but in the lower right-hand corner, 4,400 responses uh, to the forced ranking uh, survey. And again, um, a special thanks to our data um, uh, our friends over in the data and information, DAO is the, the department named Dr. Smith and um, uh, Ms. Uh, Highland uh, for helping us with uh, compiling this data. And 63% of the four strength surveys are coming from a, a parent of a current student. Uh, so again, a lot of parent representation uh, from those responses. The next slide actually has um, just a high level uh, information of the of the rankings themselves. So highest ranking on the left, lowest ranking uh, on the right, and the um, below the data. Uh, the lower the number, the higher um, the the uh, ranking uh, for that particular item. So highest ranking salary increase for teachers is number one. Number two, salary increase for all employees. Number three, increase the staff to student ratio, and number four, uh, safety and student safety. Um, the lowest ranking responses. Um, I won't read through them. And as you get to number four, you get into maybe a little bit of a gray area as to um, is that truly one of the lowest ranked um, numbers just, just due to the uh, number of uh, options for, for somebody to, uh, to select. Um, we'll dissect this a little bit more um, on the next slide, which actually has by, by uh, grouping. So who actually um, thought each of those responses were the most important. Um, in some cases, the, uh, it didn't matter um, which group was, uh, was responding to the survey, and in some uh, cases it did. So uh, as it noted in the observations, there are salary increases for teachers is popular with all groups, and so a salary increase for all employees with the exceptions of parents. So the parents did not rank salary increase for all employees as, uh, as highly as the employee and employee and parent grouping, for example. Um, increasing the staff to student ratio is popular with all groups and the parents rank safety more important than nearly all other groups. And as Ms. Mock mentioned, we had great participation with this uh, particular committee. A lot of these things were discussed in great detail. Um, one of those was that we thought that this could be, uh, some of these results could be in fact due to maybe a lack of information uh, it could be more communication based uh, as to how safe um, our schools are. Maybe our parents don't know that because apparently um, when we look at student data and as well as uh, employee data, uh, we get different results than we got from just the parents as an example. 
so the next slide actually has just a little further breakdown of this information, different ways to look at this. So which responses were um, number one is the top uh, data there. Again, this heat map, uh, I should have mentioned this earlier, green is more favorable, um, uh, red is less favorable in terms of the ranking. So you can see there is some consistency with some of the responses again by group. Um, and uh, there are some variations when it comes to uh, some of the uh, particular options for priorities. Um, the bottom data is kind of a similar report, but this is top five. So it, how many times did that particular priority for each group show up in one uh, in, in, as either uh, uh, their top one, two, three, four, or fifth priority? And then uh, those are counted up. Again, not much difference between um, the top one and the top five, uh, if you just looked um, uh, overall by color, but you can see that there are some uh, more opportunities when we're looking at uh, all the top fives for, uh, for, for things to show up that wouldn't necessarily show up that we're just counting their number one ranking. Um, so all of this information was, uh, again, looked at by the committee. Uh, we. Um, talked about this information as well as uh, all the comparative data that we looked at. So the next slide is going to actually, um, oh, I'm sorry, there's a, a, a Wordle, uh, there's um, a narrative, I think it was about uh, 15 or 16 pages of narrative from the force ranking survey. So the first survey was very open-ended uh, narrative, the second survey force ranking with a narrative uh, at the end. Um, some of those comments were very interesting. Um, we uh, uh, we did read through them, uh, all of them, not not together as a group, but uh, uh, they were shared prior to the meeting. We also went through the, this world and, and picked out some uh, some key points. So that was also taken into consideration, not just what the ranking was, but what some of the comments centered around. And you can see teachers and students um, uh, really showed up a lot. Uh, staff uh, salary increased. Uh, some of those items. So the larger the word the more prevalent in the actual responses. Um, again, all that was taken into, into consideration in the next slide, which should have the actual recommendations. And um, they wanted a little bit to, uh, to preface the recommendation that this is a, a, a the unique circumstances of, of uh, not only this year, but what is believed to be um, um, how next year will also at least start, if not uh, continue through uh, some part portion of the year. Um, and the, uh, um, the the four priorities that the committee came up with, uh, and we did some wordsmithing on this as well. Uh, so I wanted to give them credit because they did choose these words very um, carefully. So I, I am going to read them, but uh, competitive salaries and wages in total compensation packages for all employees was the top rate rated priority for from this committee provide additional academic supports for students, especially for remediation needs and to re-engage students. Um, wanted to give a special shout out to our principals who were on this committee who helped us with a lot of uh, valuable information for the committee to consider in developing. This is the second priority. Um, and then the third priority, develop a volunteer committee to study the impact of adult to student ratio on student, on student learning where needed. Um, this is to address the fact that uh, for many years, as we gather information, whether it's through this committee or other inputs, um, the student to staff ratio seems to always come up. And we shared what the cost would be to change the um, class sizes uh, in our homeroom classes. Uh, it gets rather expensive. And so um, they thought a committee should look at this to be able to uh, consider what options and maybe it's not class size, but maybe it's uh, to make sure that there's enough adults to, to students um, throughout various aspects where there might be greater needs uh, for students. And then finally, the fourth um, uh, priority was to ensure and maintain safety at campuses uh, being paramount to include the impact of mitigating strategies to combat uh, COVID in other areas of need. So um, they wanted to ensure and maintain because um, they did want to give credit for the fact that there is uh, a great deal of um, mitigation strategies already in place and safety measures that uh, that exist. Uh, and they wanted to make sure that uh, this would uh, continue even um, into next uh, school year. So um, there's really not anything that's 
uh, that requires board action regarding the committee. But both uh, Ms. Mock and myself would be happy to answer any questions. Um, we will, what we have committed to to the committee is that we would present this to the board tonight and it would be taken into consideration as we work through the budget development process. Um, that has started uh, uh, back in January. Um, this committee uh, started uh, earlier than that, but in terms of actually building a projection for, uh, for the 21, 22 uh, budget, that's uh, really an ongoing process as we're waiting for key pieces like legislative input, um, um, of final projections of student counts, staffing that uh, currently human resources is working on, things of that nature. And of course, our own uh, NST process where we get uh, uh, employee input in, in uh, future recommendations. In fact, later this evening, you'll hear from the benefit committee uh, recommendation for, for next year, which is another key ingredient in, in building in the, the budget for next year. So we'll, with that, we'll stand for any questions or actually we're seated, but. Thank you, Mr. Miglarino. Uh, board members, do we have questions? We'd like to start with um, Mrs. Ordway. I have no questions right now. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Fisher. Was it, uh, was the survey limited in who it was sent out to? Um, President O'Brien, Ms. Fisher, uh, it was not limited to who it was sent out to, uh, I, if I heard the question correctly. Um, it, uh, it was sent out uh, universally uh, to, um, uh, through uh, uh, our communications and community engagement uh, department helped facilitate uh, getting that notice sent out. And you can see, based on the results, we did get uh, uh, much improved uh, feedback in both surveys. I'm just trying to figure out if it was sent specifically to only kids that are enrolled in school now or like students that we um, that maybe during this last year have have are utilizing other options um, but would like to come back were they considered in that survey yeah and the only reason I'm asking is it just the the, the results seem odd to me um, based on what I hear back from the community I hear about the supports they want for their kids and that their priority is their students, but the survey doesn't appear that students are a priority. So I'm just wondering if it was just certain groups. I'm just trying to kind of, in my mind, make sense of the data. Yeah, I, I, don't, uh, I don't recall specifically all of the uh, modes that we uh, sent the surveys out to. Um, I think we utilized uh, for you, one of the groups you'll see is uh, community members themselves. So I think we used the, our interfaith um, uh, mailing uh, list as well as our um, uh, presidents of uh, parent organizations uh, group. As, uh, we used our business partners uh, and we used the uh, student information data that we had. It was also posted on all of our social media and on our website. But again, if somebody um, in the example that I think Ms. Fisher used, if somebody, um, you know, no longer is attending and no longer is participating in any of those, uh, I don't know if there was a way for them to uh, to yeah. directly learn about the survey, um, but they would not have been excluded from taking the survey if they would have um, had the opportunity to know it was available. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Reed. Hi, Mr. Miglarino. Um, regarding the volunteer committee for staff and student ratios, to kind of take a second look at that, um, I'm extremely supportive of, of doing that. Um, I think that, I don't know if it was last year or the year before, um, we had had some discussions about that at the governing board level to specifically look at how to balance um, some of the class sizes that were fairly large, you know, um, in particular, some of the high school classes, um, because we didn't have um, the opportunity to uh, lower class sizes across the board for everything. So um, if you could please just keep us apprised of, of how that's going and some of the different discussion items are having, um, I'm 
very interested in what um, what we're finding. And then if you could also let us know how that committee is being made up, who who is volunteering um, to be a, a part of that committee, that would be great too. Thank you. Mrs. Paperman. Yes, I have a question. According to the service, uh, salary increase for teachers popular for all groups. So I have a question as a recommendation. So, so what will be competitive? Like, I would like to know other recommendation. What will be competitive salary, uh, wages, total compensation package for all employees? So because I'm looking at the recommendation, like how would that satisfy uh, if we're looking to allocate the budget for next year, if there's going to be salary increase for staff? Uh, President O'Brien, Ms. Paperman, yeah, so we look at um, salary information uh, and benefit uh, information a couple different ways. We look at total aggregate uh, spend uh, by our comparable districts, and that was part of what the committee looked at. Um, so what percentage of, uh, of the budget is spent on salaries, what percentage of the budget is sent, spent on, on benefits? There's actually a board policy uh, related to that as well. Um, and then uh, we also look at the average teacher salary that comes out of the uh, Auditor General District Spending Report. We are expecting that report to be published probably within the next several weeks. Um, and that data is a year old, so it'll be last year's data, but it will at least, um, we have that data for a number of years and we can look at uh, specifically that. Uh, that's also, the data that the negotiation solution team looks at, as well as the benefit committees. Um, so the, the, the budget committee was looking at the same data that they're looking at in terms of uh, how much we spend in those different areas. And also maybe uh, in some ways, uh, some additional information related to uh, those that are just beyond the total spend itself. But we right now we're, I think, waiting for the average teacher salary numbers to get posted um, in the Auditor General uh, District Spending Report. And that will be the one piece of the puzzle that we don't have today that we should have shortly. Okay, thank you. And thank I'd you. I'd like to add as well, Miss um, Paperman and members yes. of the board that, um, Salaries comes up on the responses virtually every year, but when we had the forced ranking survey this year, a lot of the comments um, that came with that were where the benefits portion of that statement comes in. It was overwhelming comments from, uh, from staff that they did not want any changes to the benefits. And so that's mm -hmm. why that was included with that as well. Um, and so, whereas we don't necessarily have a policy like Jim referred to for the salaries, and we're not necessarily looking at uh, um, the comparable districts regarding benefits because you don't always know what those are for the other districts, uh, it was very important for the committee to add that to this an item uh, just to represent all the comments that we received as well. Okay, thank you, and thank you to the committee because I've been there uh, working with the budget committee with my district, and it is a challenge. Uh, thank you. Okay, um, I have a few. Well, first, thank you very much to um, both of you as well as our, our committee members. Um, it's certainly uh, good news to see the increase in the responses. Um, I am curious about do we catch and do we capture any other demographic data um, on our survey responses besides whether or not they're a parent or a community member or a staff member, like what um, region they're from or what, you know, does their student attend a K-8, a high school or, or even the school they actually attend? Uh, President O'Brien, um, no, and one of the reasons for that is um, the responses are anonymous, are, and so the more information we ask for, the less likely we are um, able to keep that anonymity um, for uh, for folks. So uh, that is intentional, uh, but we can certainly always uh, revisit that because we would uh, think that we'd be doing this budget committee again, you know, a year from now. Okay. Um, wonderful. I, I think it might be important and we can talk about it. I'll, I'll send an email to y'all, but I, I do think it might be important to have some 
information about where our respondents are coming from. Um, like Mrs. Fisher mentioned, um, I would like to have more information about the parents who are responding and, and what part of our communities they're coming from. My concern is that maybe we're not hearing from some of our uh, parents or community members, maybe in some of the Title I districts or, or, or schools. And, and that might not be true at all, but, but we don't know um, if we don't collect that. That's just kind of my thought process on that, as well as to Mrs. Fisher's point about that, is there a way for community members to sign up to receive information from the school district if they are not a parent? Uh, President O'Brien, yes, anybody can uh, uh, receive the the notices that 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 we receive that we that we send out uh, through our communication community engagement um, department. Okay, perfect. Um, and then. I am also um, excited to see the com the recommendation regarding students to staff ratio. Um, I would hope someone could footnote there, maybe when that committee is together, that we also look at the effect, you know, how effective or how much learning is achieved when you have an effective teacher. And, and I know that class sizes are in our um, agreement with our, our teachers, our certified staff, but you know, might they look at potentially having our truly, you know, our highly effective teachers taking additional students. Um, and so I just love to talk about that more, but thank you for recommending that committee. And then the last thing is that, could you please provide the board policy that talks about the competitive um, salary for teachers that you mentioned, Mr. McLarino, as well as I think it'll be important since we do have a new board member uh, to get provide a little bit of background on um, because I know we've studied this a couple different times and we talk about it every year is that the difference in our benefits from some of our um, comparable school districts. I think that would be good information for us all to have and it doesn't have to be this Friday update, but when that might be available. President O'Brien, I, I believe it's policy DBD, D as in dog, B as in boy, D as in dog. Um, but uh, yes, I can provide that uh, specifically. Uh, we'll, we'll include that in information that we provide to the board so you'll uh, see what that says. And um, just paraphrasing, I'm not reading from the policy, but uh, it does speak about the need for us to ensure that our salary and benefit combined are above the average of the five comparable districts that we use. Um, and those five districts were named at that time. We also look at a sixth district. Um, that district is the Dysart School District, because at the time they were smaller than the school, the uh, Scottsdale School District, but they have since grown. Scottsdale has uh, has lost some students over time. And so uh, actually Dysart is a larger district than Scottsdale. So if we were to do this today, we might um, have a different comparable number of districts. So we we include Dysart in the information, but they're not included in the comparable just because they weren't specifically named when this was um, put into play back in 2004, 2005, something along those lines. Wonderful, thank you so much, Mr. Miglarino. Any other comments or questions from the board before we move on to the next report? Thank you so much, Mr. Miglarino and Mrs. Mock. It sounds like we are going to move on to the return to school report, and that would mean we'll hear from Dr. Zerbach. Just give me one second, uh, President O'Brien, as we load the PowerPoint presentation. Okay, here we go. So good evening, President O'Brien, members of the board, Dr. Finch. It is our pleasure to continue providing the return to school report to you in this last week in February. It is hard to believe that we are there and that March will begin next week. I wanted to start off this uh, particular return to school report um, with an announcement about National Public Schools Week. For the, those folks who are joining us here this evening that do not know, this is a special week for public schools. 
It has been designated by pretty much all of the major associations that are out there across uh, the United States uh, that work with public schools that this is National Public Schools Week. And so with this week, we truly celebrate the awesome things um, that Deer Valley Unified does as well as our other brother and sister public school districts, both here in Arizona and across the nation. Um, in particular this year, I wanted to highlight the things that the Deer Valley Unified staff have done that truly nobody would have imagined uh, even two years ago. Gail and I were taking a, a walk the other day and said even actually 11 months ago, folks wouldn't have imagined the things that our staff have stepped up uh, to provide that uh, with respect to items such as food and nutrition and all of our um, deliveries that we have done to various points across our district to make sure that families have food um, for their kids, to the work that our community ed staff has done throughout beginning in the summer um, with our camps that we were still able to provide for in-person opportunities for those parents that needed that option. Um, to the work that our transportation staff did by helping with our on-site support um, at our schools when we were in the virtual format, to the work that our teachers have done, those who are teaching uh, both on in person and online, uh, and our, our school administrators who have just worked tirelessly since uh, that interesting day on March 13th, 2020, uh, when things certainly started to look different for us um, in public schools and everyone, just the front office staff, the custodial staff, uh, I'm sure they're, the nurses, uh, everyone has really stepped up to the plate, which I believe, and I know I can speak on behalf of the executive cabinet, um, it shows just that the public schools step up for the community. And so I'm very appreciative of everyone. Um, and I know everyone else is too. We have a couple hashtags that we're using uh, this particular week. Uh, they're there on the screen, the hashtag I love DV schools and also public school proud. And so we encourage folks who are listening to tweet out um, or if you do on Facebook to include those hashtags of something special uh, regarding why that public school in your uh, community means something to you. And so we would appreciate that. Okay, as far as updates from our three school work teams, we will begin with return to school safely. For our vaccination update, although we have provided some reminders to you in the past, we'll do it again uh, today because we've had some additional communication go out to both the community and our staff. So as you know, it is a single day event on Friday, March the 12th, where we will uh, provide second doses to thousands of folks. We notified our community of the calendar change, which is necessary uh, for that day. And we've already covered both here and in board updates why that calendar change is necessary. Um, also, our staff received a memo today, which contained additional registration details. So in the past, of course, they have already known about that second dose date, um, but we did work with our pharmaceutical partners last week to finalize some details about how that registration would occur. So we provided that info to our staff in that memo. And as a reminder to the board, that information is also contained on a portal page so that any staff member can go back and see what we have uh, provided in terms of info uh, regarding the vaccine. And as we did in the first community event, we are looking for community members or sponsors, uh, organizations to sponsor us uh, with some meals for the volunteers and vaccinators. Uh, we did get one of our sponsors from a board meeting uh, when we did this the last time. And so that's why we're um, communicating that again, because perhaps someone's listening uh, would like to uh, join us for that. Okay, uh, this is not a new slide. Just a reminder that we do continue to provide COVID-19 testing opportunities throughout uh, this month. And so folks who need a COVID test, they can come right here to the district office. We begin at noon and we end at 5 p.m. You can also see our URL friendly for parents COVID testing website for more information on testing. And then we are actively exploring March opportunities uh, with the county. In terms of us getting these uh, testing opportunities, it is a, a, a conversation that we have with Maricopa County and they look to see the need 
uh, and then how much it would cost uh, to place that within our district. And so we're looking at those opportunities, especially we're looking to identify if we can get some um, after spring break um, in our community. And so we will keep you updated as far as what we uh, work out with the county. Okay, and with that, um, it brings us to our uh, three slides, which have to do with metrics. Actually, it's four slides in this presentation today. And so to begin that, I'll ask uh, Mr. Miglarino to join us and give us an update on the three uh, school metrics. Mr. Miglarino. Uh, good evening again. Um, and as we have shared with you every Thursday, uh, Maricopa County does uh, publish new information regarding um, what they refer to as the school uh, dashboard. Um, and uh, the three metrics, uh, uh, case count, uh, positivity rate, as well as COVID-like illness, First two slides are case count and positivity rate. Um, a significant uh, decrease in positivity rate um, from down from 19, uh, just over 19% to 12.4%. Um, a, a decline again for uh, several weeks in a row now on case count, down just over 300 uh, is the case count. Um, so both of those uh, are trending in the uh, right direction. We'll make a comment that I believe it's two of our zip codes. So we also look at this data a little more granularly than just the, our, our district. Uh, two of our um, zip code, uh, two of the zip codes in our district boundaries uh, now have a positivity rate less than 10%. Uh, so they would be below the substantial threshold by zip code itself. Uh, COVID-like illness is a, a countywide measure, so not specific to our district, uh, but it has now, um, uh, for the second week in a row, uh, been below the substantial threshold uh, of 10%, uh, now down to 5.1%. Um, so uh, all, all the me three metrics have been decreasing um, for several weeks uh, uh, in a row now. And then the final um, graph happens to show the seven-day epi curve. Uh, we have been using this as a predictive model for what the data will look like for those three uh, 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 county school dashboard metrics that we looked at previously. Um, you can see uh, still a downward trend, maybe a slight flattening um, at, at the tail end of that uh, of that graph. Um, so we're watching this data closely to be able to see what uh, this might yield in terms of uh, upcoming metrics. Uh, but in, at the current pace, um, we would predict that uh, the uh, all three metrics will be out of the substantial area uh, shortly, uh, probably in the next several weeks. So um, if, uh, if all of the trends seem to follow suit to what they've been for the last several weeks. And I think the last, the next slide is yours, Dr. Z. Thank you, uh, Mr. Miglarino. And as a reminder to those uh, folks in the audience, that this data uh, that the metrics have, the ones that Mr. Miglarino covered on these two slides, cover uh, the, the, the data in the community from two weeks ago. And so as you can see, um, the last one that we just had ended on February the 6th. And so if you continue to go out, you can see there will still be that decline as uh, Mr. Miglarino told you um, with that. So we expect this week to again see um, a decline. Okay, and then our fourth slide dealing with metrics is our COVID-19 uh, district dashboard. I know there was a request um, by a board member at our last uh, governing board session to include the dashboard. And we couldn't include a snip of the actual dashboard as you cannot see anything because the dashboard is too big and the uh, print was so small. And so instead we put a uh, link to this. Um, it's a very friendly URL. Uh, dvusd.org slash dashboard. And so folks can uh, go to that dashboard and see how many active cases um, are in our uh, schools and our district facility uh, with respect to COVID-19. That particular dashboard, we have had several weeks of decline. And so that is a obviously a good thing for us. And we are now looking at numbers uh, in terms of our dashboard that reflected what it looked like pre-Thanksgiving uh, in 2020. And so uh, we 
I want to make sure that even though these numbers are declining, that our community knows we still are implementing our uh, COVID-19 mitigation plan. Uh, it's still as important now as it was uh, at any point uh, to make sure that our mask wearing uh, is done with fidelity and done right. Uh, that was affirmed by recent CDC research uh, that was published and I'll cover that in a uh, slide here in a, in a couple moments. Uh, and as well as our other uh, mitigation practices that we want to make sure the community knows we intend to com continue implementing those uh, to make sure our schools are as safe as possible. Okay, and here's that slide. And so I also wanted to uh, update folks with respect to two recent updates from the CDC. The first one is the operational strategy guidance. This has received much notoriety in the press over the past week. Uh, and I am uh, very happy to say that everything that was in that plan uh, is something that Deer Valley Unified has uh, tried to do to the best of their ability. Uh, there have been sometimes, as we have noted in our board meetings, that there are some limitations, uh, for instance, with the physical distancing. Um, however, I would say with the vast majority of items that are in there, the vast, vast, vast majority, uh, we have been able to do it uh, with a high degree of fidelity. And so that, that was uh, something we expected to see, but again, just affirming that our mitigation plan um, is tight. And also with our mask usage and effectiveness, this again is something that came out in the uh, news media quite a bit about two weeks ago. Uh, the CDC released a new report that was done as far as how masks reduce the transmission of COVID-19. And so with that, uh, really the main takeaway from that article was the importance of a good fitting or a well fitting mask. Uh, some took from that the importance of wearing two masks or double masking, but that was not exactly what um, the article said. The article talked about uh, perhaps a double mask when you don't have a great fitting uh, first mask. And so um, just to repeat again, uh, the biggest takeaway from that uh, article was the importance of a well and good fitting mask. And so uh, we will continue to promote that message uh, to our staff and to um, our parent and student community. Okay, our communication structures here, these are not new, uh, but just to make sure you know that we continue to do our Monday updates, both to our uh, staff and to our parents. And our fireside chat, we have scheduled for next week, I believe next Wednesday, where we have an opportunity to field questions from uh, any staff member in Deer Valley. We have the periodic vaccination mem memos that we have provided, uh, National Public Schools Week, we've already covered that. We also held a February stakeholder meeting where we got uh, the pulse and asked for what are the most pressing questions from our community. And we use that to help inform some of our parent updates that happened uh, subsequently to that meeting, and then also have some opportunities to get in front of our POP and interfaith communities uh, here next week. Okay, uh, spring events update. Uh, this one I know uh, garners attention. Uh, and the board has requested that we address this in our governing board meetings uh, from here on out. And so here is the uh, latest update. And so on the left, you can see spring events uh, as an update for in-person. Uh, we do fully expect to hold our high school graduation this year um, in person at State Farm Stadium. The first meeting is March the 10th. So I don't have a great deal of uh, an amount of details to report out to you right now, other than to uh, affirm that that is our intent. Uh, we believe it will happen. Uh, and so I will update you uh, after that March 10th meeting, as I'm sure there will be certain mitigation uh, structures and measures that will be in place, uh, such as limitations on the number of uh, folks that can attend, along with face masks. Also with AIA and spring sports, there have been continuing conversations with the AIA executive board uh, about what measures will or will not be taken in the spring. So we'll continue to monitor that. Uh, but at this point, we know that our spring sports uh, will continue. They actually are scheduled to start next Monday. And so that is exciting with practices and tryouts. And so we wish them uh, the best of luck. And we hope to have a successful spring season because uh, so far I'm knocking on wood right now and everyone in this room, I'm saying knock on something, right? That it has gone um, uh, 
fairly successful um, so far. So we're appreciative of that. I also have starred or asterisk seven, eight. And so whereas we have not had formal seasons for our middle schoolers in the fall and the winter, and uh, you are aware of the various reasons for that, um, we are looking to uh, perhaps provide a spring season for our middle schoolers. Uh, they did not have a season last year um, due to the pandemic. And so for our, our middle schoolers, the spring season is the one that the students wouldn't have had at least one of the two opportunities uh, in terms of playing uh, that particular spring sport. And so our athletic director, Mr. Warner, he, he is actively planning for this with the uh, middle school athletic coordinators and so more information uh, about that will be coming out, but we do expect to at least have uh, some participation in that. There will likely be limitations as far as uh, spectators. Uh, there could even perhaps be no spectators at the start, and then we will see how it goes to see if we can open that up to some spectators. Now, for some fields, that won't matter as some of those uh, fields will be able to be seen even from the street. So if parents are parking, they'll be able to see because the spring sports, uh, some of those are outside um, for the families, but we will be monitoring that and hoping to uh, perhaps provide some of that. Okay, and then also on here, some fine arts events. And you'll notice that that's on both of the, um, uh, both sides of the slide in terms of virtual and in person. And so uh, that is campus dependent. Uh, it's teacher dependent um, and student dependent. And so there are various factors uh, that go into that. And so uh, I would expect that some may be happening in person and some may be happening virtually for that. And then my fourth bullet point that I wanted to highlight is the school tour events. I know that uh, some community members and also some of our staff have been inquiring as far as when would there be opportunity um, to have community members see uh, our schools, perhaps for enrollment purposes for next year. And so I do anticipate that uh, the weeks that follow after spring break, uh, that we will be able to begin opening for some very structured uh, tour events. Those would occur uh, no sooner than, than two weeks after our March 12th event. Uh, and that should make sense because that would be uh, two weeks after folks have their second dose of vaccination. And we know from our public health agencies that that is the time frame when folks reach the full inoculation um, as far as from COVID-19. And so again, I want to reiterate that that, that wouldn't occur until uh, two weeks after and that those would be small and structured and after school. And we would make sure that our uh, plant foremen are included in those so that we can um, make sure the disinfection occurs in, in areas that they would go. More, more to come on that um, as we need additional conversation with our school administrators on, on that topic too. Okay, and then on the right side, as far as spring events virtual, uh, you can see that uh, a, a work team, uh, various folks uh, met on eighth grade promotion. And at, at this time it, it is scheduled to be virtual. Um, I believe I provided you some information in the board update the last two weeks regarding uh, the rationale for that. Uh, we do know that that will um, certainly be disappointing for some. However, there are some real limitations that are on us this year with respect to eighth grade promotion. Uh, as you know, our high school facilities will be undergoing significant construction um, during that time of year, especially with respect to our football fields where sometimes we have our events that occur. And so for our schools that have uh, larger promotion classes and many of our schools do, it just is not a, a, a space that we have right now that's conducive to doing this with the spacing that's necessary. And so um, I, I wanted to asterisk this one though, because what I do anticipate happening is that the students would have an in-person event for this. And so the students would go through uh, uh, an in-person ceremony during the day, and then we would look to uh, live stream this or record it um, for our parent population um, going forward. And then, um, as I already mentioned, the some fine arts events uh, would occur there, and then some school tour events, just as some will eventually occur in person, we'll continue to do some of those uh, virtually for the community. Okay. And with that, I will pass the baton to my comadre, uh, Dr. Galligan. Dr. Galligan. Thank you, Gary. Uh, 
So you have probably already read or heard that Governor Ducey signed um, House Bill 2402 to um, take a look at our A through F uh, school labels. So students are scheduled to take the AZM2 test this spring in April when we get back from spring break. Now those test results uh, typically decide or dictate what a letter grade is for each of our schools and what, what um, it receives from the state. Those letter grades are then tied to the amount of funding a district receives. There's nothing new there. Um, the state test, however, is currently being overhauled over the next two years, which will make it more difficult to assess whether students have grown from year to year, a key part in that whole letter grade system, and then also just with our pandemic last spring and this year. Um, so you can see there that um, he did sign that in. He had three main details um, for signing that House bill in, and those are in those three bullets. He also produced an executive order 202103, and that is um, he directs the State Board of Education to analyze the, the assessment data and then pull together a report from that data um, no later than November of 2021. So you can see that he has two very um, uh, important things that impact us. Uh, and his work also in telling um, school districts and others the importance of intervention all fits into this whole idea of working with children who have lost learning, um, but still maintaining as much um, consistency as is possible with state assessments. Whether I agree with that or not, um, I won't say, but we are bound by that um, testing right now. We will have a little bit more information about our state testing um, in March. Um, so stay tuned. That's it for me, Gary. Good evening, President O'Brien, governing board members. A few things to update you on and um, to our listeners out there virtually. We are approaching our second internal round of staffing for our certified staff. So that means that our first round will conclude, I believe, at 8 a.m. tomorrow. All of the PARs are due um, to HR so that we can see where our first round of staffing um, uh, concluded. And then any new positions that have been generated by any movement in round one will be posted this coming Thursday for round two. After round two, um, normal processes will be followed that are outlined in the certified manual. We will review surplus, um, go through surplus placement, and then begin to open positions up to the outside. And then as far as contracts go, we, um, as part of HR changes today and on consent agenda, we have a list of recommended employees in all contracted groups for renewal. And we still plan to issue contracts the week of March 8th, our goal still being March 10th. And a couple of other upcoming events, um, Gary mentioned March 12th, but before that is March 10th, ASRS is partnering with Deer Valley to support all of our employees who may be approaching retirement within the next six months. And then March 12th will be our second dose for Moderna. We did send a memo out today explaining what the school day is going to look like on this day, including what the expectations, um, work expectations will be for both the certified group and the classified group. And in a quick summary um, for work expectations, it is a half day and it is a half day attached to spring break. So we do have language for our certified employee group specific to a Friday before spring break. So all of our certified staff will be expected, of course, to, to report to their work sites to either teach for our K-8 um, campuses and middle school campuses or um, work in PLC groups or other types of activities that their principals outline for them on their morning half day and then in the afternoon they may um, leave when the responsibilities have concluded for classified works um, force it will they will follow a normal work schedule we also provided some details um, for uh, excuse of course or um, uh, allowance to leave if they are scheduled for their second dose moderna at either barry goldwater high school or boulder creek high school 
And so um, always, we'd like to encourage all of our employees or remind all of our employees to make sure that they are reporting if they've come in close contact with anyone that is tested positive for COVID-19 or are presenting any symptoms that are outlined as a symptom for COVID-19, go to covidreport.dbosd.org, um, complete that report, and someone from HR will reach out to you seven days a week to... to uh, um, but review your situation and get you back into the campus or your work site. Okay, and with that, President O'Brien, that concludes the return to school report and weekend field questions. And just as a reminder, because I'm doing the audio, uh, President O'Brien, I do need like a one second pause between um, so I can flip the switch and get the audio on. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Zerbach and um, other executive cabinet members. I'd like to um, start with uh, any questions from Mrs. Reed. Yes. Um, the first one, just Dr. Zerbach, um, thank you for putting the asterisk by the eighth grade promotion. Um, I know I've had several um, parents that have reached out over the last week and a half as we've been talking about spring um, inquiring on on how we were going to honor and recognize those eighth graders so if there is a way that we're able to do um, that virtual ceremony and allow them um, that moment of recognition and have that live streamed um, that would be my vote for that um, i i just don't want to um, have these eighth graders miss out um, at like our eighth graders did last year. Um, and along the same line with uh, high school graduation, um, it would be nice and I think very helpful and um, comforting to our senior parents to know that in case we weren't able to um, have something at State Farm, that there was a good plan B that the district um, kind of had in their back pocket um, because we've I've seen a lot of chatter on that. And because I have a senior, um, I think parents think that I have a, an inside uh, knowledge into what's going on. So, um, but I know that that's a, that's a big concern uh, as far as our 2021 parents goes. Um, and then Mrs. Moffitt, um, the question for you kind of as a follow-up to the question that I asked last week regarding um, ADA accommodations. Um, because I brought that up last week, I had had um, a handful of parents reach out and ask how an ADA accommodation um, is given. So if you wouldn't mind um, just going through what the process would be and, and the paperwork that would need to be filed and who needs to file it and turn it in and all of that good stuff, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, President O'Brien, Ms. Reed, uh, with your uh, first two points, I hear you. I was in that boat last year with my uh, eighth grader uh, who promoted on to high school. And so um, I would just say, on, again, on both of them, I, I hear you. And um, that is what will likely happen on those. And then, Jenna, is that for now or do you want to do that? Uh, okay. Um, so, Mrs. Reed, um, a quick summary, and then I can include details in the report that I submit um, on Friday. But quick guidelines um, or, or a process would be um, that an employee who believes that they need an accommodation in their work environment submits ADA paperwork. Now, all the processes that we follow are outlined um, federally for us. We review their specific needs in their work environment, um, and it's all generated by a disability. So once they disclose that information and we review that process, if we see that they do indeed need a workplace accommodation based on um, the uh, impairments caused by the disability, then we offer an accommodation. So two follow-up questions. So you can't offer an accommodation unless that has been filled out, correct? That is correct. Okay, and then is there, I know that that is a legal form, but does it have to be filed? Um, does an attorney have to file it or does it have to be filed with an attorney or does it just need to be handed in to you? 
No, the paperwork just needs to be submitted to human resources. Okay, thank you. Um, Mrs. Paperman? Yes, I have two questions. Uh, the first one uh, is on the dashboard. So, uh, yes, I'd open the link and I'm just curious uh, what's considered to be an outbreak. For example, uh, if I'm looking at Barry Water High School, there's six cases with COVID. Uh, Sandra Dale O'Connor, seven cases with COVID. Uh, no, Terra Canyon, six cases. So at what number would that be, will be considered like an out, outbreak uh, within the school? Sure. Um, good question, Ms. Paperman. So, uh, yeah. O'Brien, uh, Ms. Paperman, an outbreak is defined um, by the state, ADHS. They have it in one of their uh, executive measures. And so an outbreak is when the uh, two cases of COVID have likely been transmitted at school. And so that could be between uh, student to student, that could be between student to staff, staff to staff, or staff to student. And so the county is the one, Ms. Paperman, that makes that determination. Uh, the school district does not do that. And once the county makes that determination, then we do notify um, our uh, parent community and our staff community. And so what, what you do see, uh, which is what we've seen all the year, is that the vast, vast majority of cases that we have are brought in from the outside um, into the school. And so, and, and are not outbreaks, but we have had some outbreaks. Okay. My second question is the high school graduation. I did receive an email from a parent and also a face a message, a Facebook message from a parent regarding the 2020 students. I know my daughter graduated last year too from Barry Goldwater High School. And yes, for a lot of parents, it was heartbreaking not to see those memories that I have for my twins that graduated from Jonathan from Deer Valley and Tatiana. So, so I understand where other parents stand that they wish they had those memories, those pictures. So is there any possibility that, uh, that we can include the 2020 students uh, for this year graduation? Uh, President O'Brien, uh, Ms. Paperman, yes, that, that was uh, an unfortunate piece that the COVID-19 pandemic caused um, with respect to that graduation, along with the many other uh, events that were impacted. Uh, no, we do not have um, a planned now um, for a 2020 uh, graduation. In terms of how it works for us, uh, we have a week where State Farm has a number of districts that have been planned to have their uh, ceremonies there. And it's pretty tightly packed, uh, not pretty tightly, it is, it's tightly packed in terms of when all of the schools get in there and their specific planning for that. And especially this year, given that COVID is still uh, present with us. And so um, it, it is it is not um, a possibility that we have right now. So GCU is offering the options for the 2020 students with a district be uh, supporting that or is, oh, that's going to be separately if the parents want to bring their 2020 grants to GCU. Uh, Ms. Paperman, if, if you could just pause for one second and then restate that question to me, because um, I did not hear the uh, first part of it, so I could change that volume. JCU is offering the options uh, for the 2020 grants uh, to to provide that ceremony. Are the this is the district going to be supported with that, or, or that's going to be just independent of of parent choosing uh, to be involved uh, with GCU to do a ceremony for the 2020. Before you answer, Dr. Zerbach, let me ask a clarifying question. Mrs. Paperman, GCU is offering a graduation, a, a graduation ceremony for their 2020 graduates. So for their co college graduates. Okay, see, I'm not sure about that. I didn't do my research on that. So that's only for the 2020 graduates at their campus then. Okay. Well, I don't know that. That was I was asking the clarifying question, but if I could ask that if you yes, that's could what you it do is. some thank you. Okay. 
Okay, okay thank you. more. Okay. All right, Mrs. Fisher. Okay. Um, one of the, the, I mean, um, the Friday update, you sent us the links to these CDC guidelines for the masks and the control and the, uh, each article goes down to another 30, 40 reference articles. Um, as you read through them and you look at these summaries, um, they are, these are studies are done in, for, in and for medical facilities. They're done for uh, procedures within hospitals, for um, um, closer contact than we would have in districts. And, and, and even in the, the main one, it says uh, uh, real world effectiveness of community masking is limited to observational or ep uh, and epidemiological studies. So they're just, these studies are not actually done for the purpose of the public. They are very minimally, and I, I kind of, as I was reading through them and sharing them with some of the community members as we were discussing masks um, and their effectiveness, uh, one of them made, did make the joke, well, absolutely, if you stick a plastic bag over your head, you'll have zero transmission. It went frozen for me. I can hear you now, Dr. Zerbach. Can you hold on just a second, Mrs. Fisher? I think we're having a technical difficulty. I apologize. We just want to make sure we get your your questions answered. Ms. Fisher, you, Ms. Fisher, you froze. We, we couldn't hear what you were saying. Okay, what was the last thing you heard? You were talking about you said someone made a joke to you. Um, it, when we were discussing these studies, I show you getting knocked off. Can you still hear me? Okay. When we were reviewing these studies, as they increase more and more masks, it, it, as some of it has been political, but they, they, you know, if you put a plastic bag over your head, you'll have zero transmission and you'll die. So we, we need to, to make sure what we're doing is responsible. So let me go with my question first. When I look at these studies, number one, they are not done for the public uh, purposes. They are then later um, reviewed and assessed. Uh, they take bits and pieces of each study and so apply them to the possibility of public consumption or public use. Um, so how heavily are we relying, are we actually reading into some of this research? Because research has not been done on some of the alternatives. That's number one for me. Secondly, um, I've had parents ask, what does the metrics need to be for their student to stop having to have this mask on all the time? Um, and then the third question was, it's not specifically mass related, but it's related to our scores, essentially, and I'm not sure that it's, I'm not sure that the wording is accurate, so correct it if it's not, but it's the districts are being given a pass for their grades for the year. However, how is that translating Okay, so that they can get funded, but they're not necessarily uh, providing that to the student um, who may have had who may have their future ruined um, for their chance of getting scholarships, um, students where they may need that scholarship or where may they, they may need a specific grade. Um, so they want to know where that consideration is for their children. Um, so those are my three main concerns, um, because the studies of what we're doing with these masks, you know, I, I think we all know, I, I, and I, I, Ms. Ms. Reed can correct me if, if I'm wrong, but some of the questions for the ADA paperwork is we are still in these virtual meetings. 
that are very ineffective. Um, and people aren't aware that I have had two doctor's appointments. I have provided a letter and I have completely fully filled out the ADA paperwork. And yet we still can't come to a simple um, solution for problems for a board meeting, let alone for our students. And some students are really having time, a hard time. They don't come once every two weeks. They are there every day. So what does that look like to ensure that our students um, are in a positive learning environment? Uh, President O'Brien, Ms. Fisher, um, the I guess the first two parts, because I'm not sure if the first uh, one was a, a comment or a question um, that you made, but the overall, I guess, summary for it is that we have followed um, the guidance of the public health experts, both here locally in the state and nationally, uh, with respect to items such as face mask wearing. And so we plan to continue doing so and to adhere to their guidance as long as they would tell us that this is what's necessary in order to have a uh, safe school environment. So in terms of an actual metric, again, it would be relying upon the public health experts um, at Maricopa County, Arizona Department of Health Services, um, and the CDC. And then the last question, um, and that, could you restate that one for me? The last question uh, came is, is regarding um, the grading. Yeah, and, and basically the, the belief is that districts have been given a pass on their grades um, and, or, or been given assistance with their grades so that we can get full funding. However, we have some students, and, and I'm not, I don't think this applies to all, who their grades are significant for receiving scholarships, for receiving what they need to, to move on in college. What is the district doing either to assist these students in getting better grades if needed or helping them? Um, because we have had such a massive disruption to their ability to even go to school or, or learn. Um, getting to a Zoom meeting once every two weeks is hard enough for students who perhaps have disabilities or whatever, and they still really have to work hard for that grade, this is not conducive. So what are we doing to support them getting better grades so that they can still get those scholarships, get into colleges and do what they need to do? Uh, thank you for clarifying uh, that question. Yeah, our staff has been doing a great deal. Uh, Dr. Galligan has various work teams that have been focusing on this. And so there are various strategies that they are employing both now and will be uh, continuing to employ in the future. And then I know we utilize our existing structures as well, such as the collaborative team PLC structures, as they look to uh, make sure that our students are thriving as much as possible. And our uh, staff, they're doing a, a great job with that. So they'll continue to uh, do that work. Thank you. Okay, hey, Mrs. Ordway. Well, I'm uh, Dr. Zerba, could you please uh, clarify? Because I, what I read was that, um, what does matter what I read? I want you to explain exactly. We're going to take our tests. We're not going to receive a letter grade. Is that correct? Okay, so I guess I always thought we used, the state used the information from those tests to see how well students were doing so we could figure out how to get better. But I guess this year, year we're really gonna do it, but we won't get that information till November, correct? Um, President um, O'Brien, Ms. Ordway, the November piece is a separate piece. That's the governor is looking to have a um, special committee that is going to look at uh, some of the learning loss that may have occurred due to the pandemic. And so they'll be looking at, at that in order to make some action steps on a statewide piece. But I would imagine, Dr. Galgan, you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, that I, I would expect that the data 
is going to be given to us um, probably in a somewhat similar time frame. Am I incorrect on that, Dr. Gallion? President O'Brien, Ms. Ordway, that is that is correct. What the governor in his executive order indicated was that he is asking or directing the State Board of Education to use this current year that we are about to have in April data and compare it to previous year data to identify the um, amount of learning loss, the potential amount of learning loss. And then from there, that report will generate, um, I believe, as, as uh, Gary mentioned, action steps. We will receive, uh, similar to in previous years, our state assessment um, raw data uh, in June, which is when we typically receive it every other year. So, so that will still continue the way it is. We will have that data in June, then we'll be able to disaggregate it um, from that point on and use it to help us uh, make our own action steps based on what we know from the 2019 state assessment to now the 2021 state assessment. And then to, to that also, we're using our Deer Valley assessments right now to provide the interventions. Our counselors are continuing to look at the not only the Ds and the Fs, but also at those students that are at the high Bs and the As that have been perhaps up until now um, straight on that track for the scholarship. So we're continuing um, and maybe even beefing that up a little bit. President O'Brien, Ms. Ordway, um, we are we just actually completed our um, comprehensive assessments in math and English language arts. And actually over the next um, tomorrow at our level meeting, we'll be sharing that data, Dr. Smith will, with our administrators. And so that is um, some of the data that will inform our next steps. Our schools have already put in place um, 30, 60, 90 day plans to support our graduating seniors and our eighth grade students as well as all kids. Um, we are uh, working in a 712 work team, which I've explained in previous board meetings, just to look at an 18 month um, intervention plan that has multiple components that we'll be sharing with you at the March 23rd board meeting. Okay, and another question, are we um, in, in any kind of committee or talks with the, at least the state and uh, county, um, colleges to see what what they're looking at as this is going to be different for them too if there's going to be any kind of um i don't know sharing of information to see how um we're going to do our you know the scholarships so on and so forth president o'brien miss ordway I, I do believe that our our high school counselors um are in conversation and we have been um, continuing with our scholarship um, push for all kids, and, and that is no different. Um, our high schools are definitely um, aware of the students who would um, work hard for scholarships and are doing due diligence to ensure that those kids still have those opportunities. We can bring that information, uh, a little bit more of that information back into one of our reports or in a Friday update. That, that I knew what uh, I didn't explain it well enough. What I was looking for is to see if there's some kind of communication with the state universities and the community colleges to address what, what might be different um, between prior to, to COVID and now, if there's any talk of that. Um, President O'Brien, Ms. Ordway. Uh, we do have a meeting uh, with Rio um, planned. And then for our state universities, we do not have anything um, scheduled at this moment, but that would be something we would probably want to do through our NEVIC group of other um, the other districts. Okay, thank you. Um, I think whatever else I have, I'll, I'll send in an email, but I just, really appreciate the thoroughness of these reports um, and listening and getting it out to more and more people. Um, again, now we're live streaming and we're letting people know that they go to the um, district website and there's many things that they can find out and, and volunteer for. Um, 
for the second phase of the vaccine, um, that email, I, I don't know if the email we received was different than the employees, but it seemed to be very straightforward. Um, so I, I think that, that that should work out well. And, you know, just one note on, on masks. We have looked at reports, reports, reports. Um, there's just not one thing saying that, or there's, there's nothing that's saying that they are not um, a great piece of our mitigation. So I uh, do appreciate that we are continuing um, to remind employees, administration, and students of the great job that they are doing um, by uh, letting us continue to stay open by respecting the mitigation that we have in place. Thank you. Mrs. Reed, did you have a follow-up question? Yes, I did, and I don't know um, who would like to answer this um, from the cabinet, but um, to follow up on what Mrs. Fisher was asking about funding, I think it's important just as a reminder and a clarification on how um, the, re the relationship between AZ Merit scores and uh, funding for K-12 schools, um, because I, I don't want people um, in the community to think that we're solely funded on whether or not we have um, and or an A school, a B school, a C school. So kicking that off to you guys. President O'Brien, Mrs. Reed, our general funding actually is completely um, unrelated to our test scores. We are funded on our average daily membership, which is the aggregate enrollment from the first day to the hundredth day. And so typically there may be some special funding such as results-based funding that would be tied to those test scores. We know that results-based funding is going to continue um, and the state continues to use older metrics to be able to provide that funding. We uh, just received our allocation for this year based off of I think three different years worth of um, data sets. They look at Title I, socioeconomic stat status data, uh, test results, and I think I, we can send it to you in the Friday update. There are about three different fiscal years that they look at for that data, but that's typically the only fund um, that's related to the test scores specifically, but our general funding is uh, based on our enrollment. Um, thank you all very much. I appreciate, um, once again, your very thorough report. I appreciate you including the dashboard link right there for um, folks who are following along at home. Um, I think it's a, some very exciting news to hear that we will be having our, our high school graduation as well as um, being able to honor our eighth grade -ers. Um And with that, I think we can move on to our, uh, we have no public comments tonight, so we will be moving on to our consent agenda. Ms. Right. I would move that the governing board approve the consent agenda item 6A through 6J. I second. We have a, a motion and a second to approve consent, agi consent agenda items A through J. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And I am going to abstain from this vote. So um, that will be four to zero. Thank you. And now Would we Would you like me on. to move to 7A? Yes, ma'am. All right, moving on to 7A. I move that the governing board accept the administration's recommendation for to pre-approve the addenda as presented. A second. Oh. Is there any discussion on this item? 
Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Mrs. Fisher, are you voting on this item? Okay, thank you. I, I did vote, I just did it. I'm just, my iPad's over there. <laughs> That's thank what I you. Was doing. Got it. I'll, um, any nays? Hearing none, the motion appro is approved unanimously. Moving to 7B. I would uh, move that the governing board accept the administration's recommendation to approve the revised 2020-21 fee schedule. I second. Thank you. We have a um, motion to second to um, Mrs. Mock. Do you have anything to say to this item? President O'Brien, members of the board and guests watching online. We typically in June and July bring the fee schedule for the following school year to the governing board for approval. As you know, we are not allowed to uh, charge district fees to students without uh, governing board approval first. Um, this item that we're adding tonight is in line with fees that we are already charging to students. We currently charge, and I do apologize, when we submitted the revised fee schedule, we should have highlighted what we added. Under high school, we are adding an advanced placement test prep fee. The fee is $175 and it provides a 0.5 credit hour for any student who takes it. This particular course is going to be offered by our DVUSD Pathways, um, also affectionately known as our night school. Um, it will be available to, we're actually starting with AP Calculus and it will be available to any AP student at any five of our high schools to take through DVUSD Pathways. Um, the fee is because uh, it's to cover the cost of the course. And as always, anytime we charge a fee, we authorize our principals to waive it for any student for which it's a hardship. Um, I'll take any questions that you have, but otherwise it's uh, in line with the 0.5 credit that we charge currently for uh, credit advancement or credit recovery. But we were adding it to the list specifically, one to point out to our students that we're now going to have this available starting next month. And uh, two, just to make sure that we've approved test prep fees specifically, whereas the others are um, standard course recovery or uh, advancement. But since we are offering a, a 0.5 credit uh, for elective, it also could be a little bit of credit advancement for the students as well. Thank you. Are there any, Mrs. Fisher, do you have a question? <laughs> Um, just, it, it, it's a very brief question. I'm glad I reread that and listened to you because I was thinking we were charging for the advanced placement test. Um, I see that it's credit um, for the course, the, the test. Um, we can use tax dollars, um, tax credit dollars for things like um, tests. Is there any potential for individuals to be able to donate directly to a fund to cover this type of a course for our students? President O'Brien, Mrs. Fisher, and members of the board. Um, tax credit legislation allows us to pay for the testing fee itself um, and extracurricular, um, like a study hall, something like that. So definitely if members of the public wanted to donate to uh, the extracurricular activity tax credit for the district, um, that would be something that we could use toward those kids. And, and maybe that's something that could very well be used to help scholarship some of those students that we waive the fee for because um, they are you know, have a financial hardship. Okay, because I just think it would be really beneficial if we maybe seek to to encourage people to donate for this purpose specifically um, just because it does encourage our, our students to to seek that type of advancement. Thank you. Is there any other discussion on this item? 
Seeing none, I will call for the vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any against, say nay. Um, hearing no nays, that passes unanimously. So we will move to 7C. Um, I would move that the governing board award a pre-construction services contract to Chase Boving team for the Innovation Center project using job order contract uh, 1 GPA 18-15 PV-03. I second. Okay, we have a motion and a second, Mr. Miglarino. President O'Brien, a member of the board, Dr. Finch, uh, just very quickly, uh, we have talked about the Innovation Center on a number of previous occasions. Um, this is uh, repurposing the annex uh, currently on the district office complex site. Um, we have made a determination that uh, we think that we want the um, the actual a, a contractor themselves to help us with the estimate of cost uh, to make sure that uh, the budget that we've allocated for this project is within uh, reach to meet the expectations. This award would just allow them to get us to uh, what we call design development or DD set of so not all the way through the process of a construction document set but design development uh, to be able to make sure that um, the, the budget's going to be adequate um, for this particular project. Uh, there would have to be a future award by the board to um, make the award for uh, either the Chase Building Team or any other general contractor to actually perform the work. Uh, it would be our recommendation at this point if the budget is adequate for the, the project itself to continue with Chase Building Team uh, and have them complete the project. But we first want to make sure that the allocation of, of, of the dollars that we have are going to be sufficient. And so that's why uh, this is uh, an action item for the board to consider this evening. They happen to answer any questions. Are there any questions from board members on this item? Hearing no questions, I will call for the vote. All those in favor, um, please say aye. 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 Any, all those against, say nay. Hear, hearing none, the vote passes unanimously. Are we ready to go on to 7D, Mrs. O'Brien? Yes, I believe so. All right. So, President O'Brien, oh, I just pause you for one second. Um, yes. I'm being told it was not a unanimous vote, so that we can clarify. Oh, okay. Thank you, Dr. Zerbach. Um, is that so? It was a four-one vote. Um, I'm not sure, President Brown. Hold on one second. I believe it was only four folks voting. It's a four-zero. I abstained. So, uh, an abstention. Okay. Thank you for that clarification, Mrs. Fisher. Appreciate that. Um, so the last vote was four to zero with an abstention. Thank you. All right, um, so move, sorry. move on to 7D. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I would move that the board approve to revoke the COVID-19 resolution previously approved for the 2021 school year. So Mrs. Paperman, this was well, we your... need to have a second. Oh, sorry, I, I apologize. Yes, I need a second. I'll second. Thank you, Mrs. Fisher. Um, Mrs. Paperman, you had requested this agenda item with Mrs. Fisher's support. Would you like to um, start us off? The resolution is on the screen. Uh, yes. Uh, Yes, a lot of community members uh, have uh, requested uh, for this for the board since we were voted by the people for the governing board to 
to vote it for a school to be open or closed. Uh, that it should not be the decision of the superintendent, which I also, as a teacher, I can see this to be also a conflict within the school district because I truly believe the superintendent uh, should be build, uh, building that positive relationship with staff. I think if anyone is going to be angry, uh, it doesn't matter if the school is closed or open, if they're going to be angry, you know what, let them be upset or have resentment with the governing board. We, we were elected by the people, so this is something that the burden should be put on us, not on Dr. Finch. So this is something that I believe is going to make a difference within the district and, and uh, and the goal in building relationship with staff that we should not have the superintendent make that decision. The cabinet and Dr. Finch is doing an amazing job on the process, um, uh, um, following, following CDC guidelines and everything that's put in place within the district, but it became uh, very negative even within the community. Uh, of, of who's making the decision because we're expected as governing board, the people put us here uh, to to make decisions for that, especially major decisions. You know, like every, you know, there's like I said, there's a division uh, within the community. People are afraid, you know, of their lives or people, you know, that they want their children back into the classroom. So, so we're not going to please both parties. But the question is, regardless how we vote, the governing board is the one that made that decision on that aspect. Thank you, Mrs. Paperman. Um, are, is there any other comments that want to be made now, or um, shall I move over to hearing from Dr. Finch and Cabinet? I'll go ahead and, and um, at least give my reasons for, for supporting Ms. Paperman. Um, number one, I, I, do, I do think when a governing board requests, a member re requests something to come forward, that it, it should be brought forward. Um, and, and, and that's uh, in part why I did support Ms. Paperman. Um, but as I read further into it, um, and, and her reasons I do think are very valid. It, we are elected by the public for governance. Um, and I, I, I find it problematic that some areas, very minimal areas, but some areas of this basically do away with that governance piece that we're elected to do. So that's a concern. First, I wanna note that when you look at this, some of the powers that it gives the superintendent or the cabinet, the administrative things that they already have um, in our current laws, in our current policies, in our current processes as written. So some of what is in here isn't even really necessary to be a resolution. They're already provided authority or lines of authority to our administration as administrators. Um, and as a prime example of that would be closing a classroom or closing a even a whole uh, school if we did have a, a major uh, breakout or major where it becomes more of a governance issue is when we're talking about closing or changing um, the entire district. That then becomes a larger piece that is um, really something that should be put before the board and the board should take the responsibility as dictated in statute um, for those for that type that level of a decision. The other portions are, they're already granted to our superintendent and our cabinet um, in, in statute. Under section four um, is where I notice where they talk about, you know, closing the school, multiple schools or all schools. Um, it's that all schools part that it becomes a more of a concern. And, and I understand why the community is so upset about feeling like the board has um, abdicated their responsibility. When I read it, that was my first thought too, is that they have abdicated their responsibility of governance as dictated in statute. Um, otherwise, there's not a point to having a governing board if they're not going to provide governance. Um, the other thing is that I look into section five. I do find it's 
problematic that we're actually giving the superintendent authority to suspend compliance um, with or implementation of the same and referring back to our board policies. Basically this, and one of the questions that I, on a regular, it's like, why are we allowing an, an employee or someone to just um, basically throw out board policies? Uh, well, honestly, this grants the, the authority to the superintendent to basically just get rid of all board policies if they don't meet his agenda. And I, and I think that's problematic. And that's not even regarding Dr. Finch. We could have any uh, superintendent. I don't think that's really an appropriate thing to have in here. Um, also, when I look at section seven, um, it talks about um, if the resolution conflicts with or superseded by a federal act leg or state legislation or local ordinances, the district shall comply with those laws. Well, one of those laws is our responsibility to do our job. So as board members, the statute already tells us what we're supposed to do. Um, and the resolution is parts of it are just not necessary and parts of it are essentially contradictory to itself. Um, so I think it's problematic that the way it's, it's um, written that it's it's a piece of paper that really um, doesn't have any teeth but it's being implemented um, in a way that it is causing um, a dissension in our community a dissension amongst um, various parent groups one parent group that agrees with keeping it is is in in direct conflict from the other um, and, and in fact, I spoke at LD1 last night, and one of the first things that I asked was, what do you think is the responsibility of a board member? I ask that all the time when I speak to um, our various constituents, and the thing that they say is, we expect you to be responsible. We expect you to provide governments. We expect you to um, be mindful of our funds. We expect you to hold accountability and transparency. Um, and I think this document kind of takes that away. Um, so that's why I support Ms. Paperman and that is why I do support um, removing it. However, I, I do want the public to be aware that even if it is removed, some of what is in it is already granted to our superintendent and our cabinet um, within statute. So that's my take. Thank you, Mrs. Fisher. Um, Dr. Finch, do you want to speak now or do you want somebody from the cabinet to speak? Hi. Okay. Um, I can take. Is somebody talking? It looks like Dr. Finch is speaking, but I don't hear any words. Dr. Zerbach, we can't hear Dr. Finch if he is speaking. Try it again. Thanks again for um, thinking about uh, the superintendent and the job that I have. It's a unique one, yes. I'm the one employee of the of the school board. So when the school board votes um, to put a resolution in place, for example, um, like this, it's uh, it's debated. In this case, this was written, I believe, by ASBA school board member um, attorneys, not uh, not ours. Um, and again, this was in response to the pandemic uh, nine months ago. The hindsight's 2020, as you know. But I think that it has served us well for two main reasons. And Ms. Fisher kind of alluded to it a little bit, um, although it's kind of a misinterpretation, but the, 
the um, the first real key piece is um, really about speed and accuracy uh, with uh, response. So, um, for example, number one, if if we have to, like yesterday, uh, we closed uh, an eighth grade uh, classroom or a eighth grade wing um, at a school. If, uh, if we didn't have the authority, we wouldn't be able to um, uh, do that without a school board meeting. Um, that's why, again, in Michigan, when snowstorms come, we don't have we don't have school board meetings the night before to sign up if we're going to have school or not. The superintendent makes that call. The um, and, and the state legislature has minutes and days, and then you have to fit within that parameter. If we miss those parameters, then the school board extends the calendar, extends the days, et cetera, et cetera, upon the math that the the um, the district office figures out because you have to meet those requirements. The second part is um, in relationship to uh, board policies or the certified manual in particular. If you remember at the very beginning of this pandemic, we knew that there would be situations that we would have to get together with EVA and say, hey, we need teachers to cover X, Y, or Z because um, uh, we've now hit a certain threshold of staff members not being able to fulfill their duties. And so it became a team approach. And it's been very effective. We meet, we meet with them all the time. Um, Ms. Moffitt does weekly. Um, uh, Dr. Z does. Uh, I do as well. And so um, that, that, that's why that was written, written that the, the accuracy, so we could work out um, details related to managing the lunchroom, recess, um, et cetera, et cetera, helping out with the bus, all kinds of different options that are in the certified manual that we may have to bend for a day or two to get us through a situation. So that's why that was written. And so, um, and you wouldn't want to have a board meeting every time you had a, you, in the old days, we, we would have an MOU and we would have to fill it out, sign it, everybody sign it, vote on it, et cetera, et cetera. And so that kind of, um, surpass that um, because we need to have speed and accuracy when we're responding to a COVID environment. So the, um, the this resolution has been uh, successful. I think it's been executed accurately. Uh, I can't think of any incident or any situation that we could have done differently. And maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but Deer Valley, um, the cabinet here has been uh, on top of the game worked well with staff members and in, in the groups to get us through the pandemic. And then because of this resolution, we've been able to navigate it effectively. And so um, I, I, again, well, thank you for your concern, but I wouldn't recommend removing it at this time, just because we'd still need to be uh, nimble and we'd still need to be accurate. And um, time is always our enemy in a pandemic. So um, that would be my recommendation, but this is your resolution. Thank you, Dr. Finch. Um, Mrs. Reed, do you have any comments? Um, I just have a few quick things. Um, first of all, if you remember, you know, the governing board didn't always agree with some of the things that Dr. Finch um, was doing, and we had, um, you know, we we took back some of that authority when we felt like. It needed to be um, looked at again, and that's when we um, voted, the last board voted to um, stay virtual at the beginning of, of the school year. So um, with the discussion going back to when we um, adopted this resolution, that was the understanding was that at any, any time, the governing board did not um, align with what Dr. Finch was doing, that we would come to him and um, have a discussion and bring it to a board meeting. And um, essentially, we could outvote him um, and, and what he wanted to do. Um, in my opinion, um, second point I'd like to make, in my opinion, um, I don't believe that this resolution has created any sort of um, division or animosity within the community. Um, I believe that the division and animosity that has come um, with the community is just about COVID and about the, the loss and the change in our life and um, grieving the things that, that we haven't been able to do and um, the loss of, uh, losses of our friends and our family and just 
normal way of living. And um, a lot of the division has become political, um, like has been brought up before, you know, of, of what side of the aisle you fall on when it comes to COVID. So um, I think that, you know, this may certainly be an avenue that people have chosen to use um, to um, exercise their their division, but I don't think that this has caused any division. Um, and then the third point that I wanted to make is that um, the community has been extremely vocal and been extremely mad at the governing board at multiple times um, from both sides of, of the decisions that we've made for closing schools and, and opening schools, for uh, virtual school and um, in-person school, for mask wearing and non-mask wearing. It, it doesn't matter um, if we have fully made the decision or we have consulted in the decision um, making with Dr. Finch, we have gotten the brunt of this. Um, and we do listen to the community and we do, um, you know, have to carry those decisions and that weight on our shoulders. Um, so, you know, I, I stand behind the way I voted um, when we passed this resolution and um, I, I don't agree with um, removing it right now. There are still too many moving pieces when it comes to COVID and too many decisions that need to be made, um, you know, in split second um, decisions. Um, my only ask again would that be that Dr. Finch would continue to be transparent and continue to inform the board of decisions that he makes um, as soon as possible after those decisions happen. Um, so that as a board, if we don't agree with something, we can um, call a meeting and put it on an agenda and take a vote on it. So that's where I stand. Thank you, Mrs. O'Brien. Thank you, Dr. Finch. Thank you, Mrs. Reed. Mrs. Ordway? Uh, Mrs. Reed, you've covered quite a bit. Um, and Dr. Finch, thank you. Um, at some point, uh, maybe Ms. Moffitt can uh, allude to the um, the complexity of the contracts that we have. Um, I don't see a dissension. Um, perhaps there might not be an understanding if um, this authority that was given has been um, perhaps explained incorrectly or there's some misinformation. It certainly does not in any way, shape or form take or abdicate our responsibility. What it does is it shows that we um, have great courage and responsibility and trust. Yes, I use the word trust um, for our superintendent and his team to make sure that the best decisions can be made quickly without having to worry about um, what time, how can I get the board together? At no point in time does this give him or any superintendent the right to uh, do something that we could not undo in one second. And I would not um, believe that uh, we have a superintendent that we have hired that we don't trust. Um, his decisions are transparent. He's very team oriented. Uh, the decision to start school earlier was something that the board did not agree on. We met, we did not start at their anticipated date. So if you read your Friday updates, if you keep involved with um, all the information that's sent to us, you get a great big full picture of what is going on in this district, what our decisions um, are gleaning, and what we might have questions on. At no point in time are we precluded from researching further. We're never precluded from sending the uh, superintendent an email asking for an explanation uh, to see if there's anything better that we need to do. So I, I, I will always stand by this um, decision. Um, and I can understand that we have two new board members that did not live through this as leaders of a district. Um, you, you could look at it from the outside, whichever occupation you're in, you could have dealt with it that way. But when you are on a governing board in 
uh, service to 35,000 students, you make sure that whatever decision you're making is going to be optimal for their safety. And this was that optimal decision, and I continue to stand by it at this point. And again, if Mrs. Uh, Moffat would like to um, be included in this, Mrs. O'Brien, that's fine. And if she doesn't want to, I understand that. Thank you, Mrs. Ordway. Mrs. Moffat, do you have um, anything to add to the conversation? President O'Brien, Mrs. Ordway, I think what I would add, maybe to clarify for section five, um, and to provide some history for our um, newer two board members, is that it, it, it outlines in this specific area, policy and statute, because much of what is written in our employment agreements aligns with policy and statute. So what drove this specifically was that we were learning quickly that we had to be very, very agile on a daily basis and that the decisions that we were making were often um, in conflict with what the certified or classified manual said we needed to do with our employees. We also didn't wanna take advantage of our employees by any means because those agreements were thoughtfully put together. So um, this language was crafted and shared with the board back in the summertime so that we could um, make the adjustments necessary without bringing it in front of the governing board every single time we needed to change practice. So um, what really initiated that was when we brought the MOU forward and we started um, adjusting the staffing standard for the, this school year. And then the very next day we noticed, well, this, uh, there's another area that we're also going to have to adjust and we can't possibly do it quick enough and bring it in front of the board every single time. So we made an agreement with the certified group that we would meet with them regularly and that when we did not notice these things, um, that, there would be, that there was a conflict that we would meet, review what practice we were going to put in place. And then that also um, largely drove these return to learning reports that we have in, in our governing board meetings so that we could bring you up to speed um, for the return to work group on what we were working on or any adjustments that were necessary. Another um, last thing I would say is that there um, is possibly times where we still will bring something in front of the governing board. For example, if um, there were to be a change like last year where the governing board um, supported us in the recommendation of um, pausing the slow as part of the evaluation because we just didn't have the ability in the closure to complete that and found it very necessary to have board approval on that, that specific item, we brought it forward to you. We could see something like that still in the spring where we find it very, very important that we see a specific board action on it. Um, but on that topic, we are set up for evaluation. And so there's no, no worry there on this, on this year. Thank you very much, Mrs. Moffat. Um, so I'm just quickly going to say that um, this resolution um, has an end date. It is the end of this 2020-2021 school year. Um, in addition, um, and, and somewhat ironically, uh, the very date that we passed this resolution is also the date that the board voted to um, not come back to school in person and to extend being virtual um, later than was recommended by our superintendent and, and cabinet members. So um, I, don't, I don't believe um, that revoking this resolution at this time is necessary. I appreciate that um, our two new board members um, brought it forward and, and that we've had a chance to discuss and, um, and maybe some education to, to folks who maybe weren't following the school board meetings as closely back in, in July and August. I think it has worked um, to help us get through this pandemic. Um, I think that a lot of emergency powers as we're hearing now um, often have no ending, but because we do have an end date for our resolution and as that is the end of the school year, as well as a line for our superintendent to inform us of actions taken um, under this resolution that um, I am comfortable um, 
as I also trust him and our, our executive cabinet. So um, if there's no further discussion, then I move. I do still have further discussion, Ms. O'Brien. Okay, Mrs. Fisher. Well, first I would like to point out, as I said before, the emergency um, small things, the, the smaller administrative tasks are already in statute. They're already provided. What this provides is the larger um, events like closing the schools completely for two weeks, going virtual, um, things of those nature, of that nature, um, or basically not following our policies. Um, and it, it isn't, um, as Ms. Ordway said, in a second that we can change that. This resolution allows the superintendent to make a decision that impacts all 32,000 students and to get a board meeting in place to say we disagree with him um, will take could take up to two weeks. It could take a week. It could take, uh, he could already have done it, it, it and the decision been made, done, and completed before we have a chance to even disagree with it. Our board is being merely informed of decisions that may or may not um, be in the best interest of students, irrespective of how they impact the students. Um, and that's what we were elected to do, is to actually advocate for our students. We were not elected to advocate for, um, we were not elected to advocate our responsibility 100% to one person. Um, when I talk to our constituents, they say what their expectations are, and that is that we um, provide governance. Um, and I know ASBA has the line that we hire a good superintendent and just support and rubber stamp anything he says. But that is not what our community has asked us for. Um, and this in no way prevents our superintendent from doing the emergency things that he needs to. They don't require, uh, um, there's no requirement for a governing board meeting every time they have to do one of the smaller things that have been noted. But at this point, from what I have seen, the governing board just gets notified of what's happening without any input. Um, and I'm sorry, but no, not all board members can just um, email the superintendent and get a response. Um, and often when I read our Friday updates, they're full of misinformation. Um, so I am highly concerned that, and regardless of how the vote, vote, the vote goes, and this is what I've told people who have asked, I've said it, it takes three. Um, all superintendents know they have to have three. Um, and so I don't expect that it will be revoked. However, I want to make it clear that um, maintaining our abdication of responsibility is not what we were elected to do. And I will just leave it at that. Thank you, Mrs. Fisher. Any other comments? Okay. Well, I think the community will have better understanding that this is there's an end date that you said, um, and Ms. O'Brien. So I, uh, so I think that's you know like this was done in July, and I'm sure a lot of people in the community weren't there. These children probably were not in school, and this resolution was you know discussed during that time. But since you're saying that it's going to be an end date time, then you know this this probably. The community hearing this, you know, probably uh, will reconsider until, you know, until the ending time. So, but uh, my goal was to make sure as other districts, other governing boards, they're the ones that vote for this. So this is, you know, what I see. I know in my district and other districts that I see. And so for me, even as an educator, you know, given uh, the superintendent, the decision as a whole to close the district, yes, I will say that can create 
uh, resentment within staff and in, within people within the community. Uh, the superintendent was not a person that was voted in this position. So that, that this is why I brought this, this to the agenda. Thank you, Ms. O'Brien. You're welcome, Mrs. Paperman, and, and you're right. The constituents did not elect the superintendent. They elected the five governing board members who at the time last July um, voted for um, this resolution in the midst of a pandemic um, at a time when we were all experiencing something that we had never experienced, nor had our parents or, you know, our grandparents uh, in some cases. And I appreciate Mrs. Fisher's perspectives um, on this as I do my, my fellow board members. Um, and sometimes we, we just aren't all going to agree on things. And that's what happens when you put five people um, in positions and they have to vote on things. So it is important for folks to note that um, things have had to be very nimble. This ends with this school year um, and we will go forward from, from there Ms. Unless, unless it is voted down. Excuse me, I'm not quite done, Mrs. Fisher, if you could just hold on one second. Not um, a problem. Unless uh, this, you know, unless the board chooses tonight to vote it down. Yes, Mrs. Fisher. I just want to point out that we keep saying it has an end date. It is the second like resolution. The first one had an end date as well. Um, so we can't say that this won't come again in July and then come again the next July and then the next July. Um, it, it, in my opinion, is a control piece. Sorry, um, you, and, uh, I apologize. I, you broke out when you said... Okay, everybody's back. Okay, Mrs. Fisher, me? I apologize for that. Could you finish? Okay, my point is this is the second resolution. The first one also had an end date. This one will have an end date, and there's nothing to say that it won't come back every year. I want the public to be aware of that, and I want them to be aware that so long as the superintendent has a guaranteed three or believes he does, it may come back every year. Um, regardless of a pandemic or not. Um, obviously, we, if it's not well down or if it is, but I, I do want the public because that's the main, that's who our, our supervisor is. I want them to be aware that this could be something that comes back annually um, for indefinite, uh, an indefinite amount of time. Mrs. O'Brien, could I say something to that, please? Yes, Mrs. Ordway. As with any resolution, depending upon whether it's necessary, it could come back again and we vote on it again. We talk about the merits or, or if there's no merit. So I want the public to know that as they are increasing and in watching and being involved, um, they understand more now what resolutions are for and that they're not abdicating power. What they're doing is um, empowering our superintendent and cabinet to make sure that we get things done um, in an expedited way for our students and staff and community. And yes, in a second, we can change it. Um, we don't have to wait two weeks to have a board meeting. We can have emergency board meetings um, when we need to have them. So. Just to make clear on um, from where I'm sitting, I've not ever abdicated power. I've not rubber stamped anything. I understand and research, ask questions, and then make decisions that end in, I did this for the best interest of the students. Thank you, Mrs. O'Brien. And I would ask that you call the vote now. Okay, with that, we will call the vote. All those in favor of revoking the COVID-19 res resolution um, approved earlier this year, please say aye. 
All those against revoking the resolution, please say nay. 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 Um, I didn't hear the other board members, so I don't know what that vote was. Dr. Zerbach, could you find out from Mrs. Taylor what the vote ended up being? So I, I voted. I did vote to go ahead and, and um, maintain responsibility for our duties. Um, so you and voted I was, uh, <laughs> Thank you. Yep. That's all I need to know. Dr. Zerbach? It, but, uh, President O'Brien, it was one to four. It did not pass. Okay, it was a one four vote, um, did not pass. Thank you all very much. Our next item is a preview item on a proposed recommendation for our fiscal year 2022 benefit uh, recommendation, and that will be Mr. Miglarino. Uh, President O'Brien, members of the board, uh, Dr. Finch, um, I will try and keep this uh, brief just in the interest of time, uh, but the Employee Benefit Committee, uh, which is in uh, the language of both the certified and classified manual, um, uh, they have been busy this year, they've been meeting virtually, uh, so I did want to acknowledge the group uh, for their participation in developing this recommendation. Our thought being uh, to preview this tonight and then to bring it back at a uh, the next board meeting um, as an old business item uh, to get any input from the board regarding what the uh, the benefit committee is recommending for the benefit packages for uh, human capital for next year. Um, here are the benefit committee members. I won't read them, um, but we do have representation. Uh, from administration. We do have a couple staff members from our payroll and benefit department. Um, uh, uh, the Deer Valley uh, building uh, leadership team is represented. Uh, our classified uh, support group is represented as well as the Deer Valley Education Associates, Association, our certified group. Uh, notation in the box there is that uh, representatives from Valley Schools and Hayes uh, did join us on several times, uh, several of the meetings, I think at all of, uh, three of the meetings. Uh, here's the meeting schedule. Uh, we started back in December, which is very typical for us, usually late November, early December. Um, and we were able to finalize the work uh, just last week on uh, February 17th. Um, there was a lot of information that was um, was provided to the committee over those three meetings. I think the one thing that um, was most telling is we are seeing a reduction in claims in our medical um, uh, plans of, uh, since the pandemic. Uh, we think that there could be some uh, some pent up demand when it comes to elective uh, procedures that people may be uh, postponing at this point in time. But we are seeing a loss ratio of about 76% um, currently uh, for this year. That has ranged from a low of 72% in one month to a high of 90 Three percent, I think, in in, in in one month. So, we're seeing some um, varying uh, information that helped formulate uh, this recommendation. Uh, so, the with a seventy six percent loss ratio, uh, we did receive a zero um, uh, percent uh, renewal. So, no dollar increase to be able to maintain the benefits uh, that we had to offer. Wanted to point out, I think this might be the sixth year in a row that uh, Valley Schools did not increase the fixed costs uh, for uh, um, the medical plan um, that, that we have in place. That also helped contribute to maintain the 0% renewal. Um, the one big change for, for what is in this proposal is the four tier option. Um, and just to familiarize uh, folks with this, uh, currently, we have two options for employees to select for on our medical plan. That is uh, an employee and then a family coverage where you can um, uh, cover multiple dependents under the family plan. A four-tier option would provide two additional plan options. One would be employee plus spouse for somebody who wanted to cover uh, a spouse and one that would be employee plus children or child or children. Um, adding those two uh, tiers have been talked about for a number of years, and I'm talking many, not just uh, the last couple of years. It's 
always been more expensive to add those two tiers in, even though the cost of those plans is less expensive. The, the um, what, what it causes is it causes the family plan to, to get even more expensive than it currently is. And because we had the benefit of a zero renewal, the benefit committee thought this was an opportune time for us to in introduce those uh, two additional tiers so that uh, employees that might have this need would have more cost effective options without raising the rate on the family coverage. Uh, I should point out to the board that this actually will cause some of the reserves to be used to be able to cover this, uh, this, this option, but it's a small amount. It's about $157,000 of, of uh, our reserve balance. So it's very nominal based on the reserve balance that we have with Valley Schools. But this will allow additional options. We think even that $157,000 could be made up by participation because we think there are some people that don't opt to pick up the family coverage because of the expense related with it. Um, and, and this might give them different options that may be cost, more cost effective from what they're currently providing uh, coverage for. So that's the biggest change uh, that you're gonna uh, hear in, in terms of the, the, the recommendation. Um, thank, thankfully, there weren't a lot of federal changes in terms of um, out-of-pocket maximums and uh, deductible uh, thresholds for a high deductible health plan. So you'll see many of these things are just memorialized here as there are no changes moving forward. Um, the last slide uh, does have the increase, a slight increase to our life insurance plan, the district sponsored life insurance plan. Um, this we can attribute to uh, COVID. Uh, so life insurance in general has increased. There's a slight increase you can see. It's uh, not quite a penny per thousand uh, at eight tenths of a cent um, on the district sponsored plan. The voluntary uh, life coverage that we offer our employees will not increase. So that's uh, good news for, for um, uh, our employees that opt for that. Uh, and then the only other significant change um, uh, for um, on, the, on the wellness side was to add additional well style points to encourage more participation as a well style champion at all of our sites. Um, this would be just to encourage them to uh, participate. Our well style champions lead our wellness programs um, in things like um, yeah, healthy uh, challenges, things of that nature. Um, this will just give them uh, a little bit more incentive to be that well style champion uh, at our locations. Uh, we did note, as we've talked before, there's gonna be a slight increase in the Arizona State Retirement uh, contributions. You can see them listed there currently at 12.22%, increasing to 12.41%. I bring that up because that will be important as we look at um, any salary um, uh, recommendation that comes out of the NST process, uh, because um, in order for our employees to not see a reduction in their, uh, you know, their net check, their take home pay, if you will, um, there would have to be at least the offset of that increase right there uh, to be able to have them have the same take home pay in, into next year. So that's something that the NST group is, is working on. Uh, again, the plan is to uh, preview it here tonight, um, field any questions that you have and bring it back at a future meeting. That will allow us to uh, begin the open enrollment process. It would have to be done virtually again. It was done last year virtually. It will. Uh, be um, carried out virtually again this year, but with the four tier option, we definitely want to extend the period of time so that people, uh, our employees have more time to decide if that's something that they want to consider uh, in their benefit offering for next school year. So with that, I'll answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Miglarino. I only have one question and that is, um, was this a unanimous recommendation from the um, committee? Uh, President or I'm sorry, uh, President Orway, yes, it was a unanimous recommendation from the committee. Wonderful, Mr. Miglarino. Um, I'd like to uh, thank all of the committee members um, for their work in, I know every year they work very um, diligently to um, come up with the best recommendations for uh, 
all of our employees and, and do their best to minimize um, cost increase as well. So, so kudos um, and kudos to Valley Schools as, as well for not increasing our fixed costs. Do you, um, Mrs. Ordway, do you have any questions? Yes, um, for Mr. Mock, I mean, Mr. Magdaleno. Um, that was kind of like President Ordway O'Brien. Anyway, um, my question is, thank you very much for getting that four tier in there. I think we've been talking about that, um, something along those lines for years. I'm glad that we're there. Um, and when we talked about the amount of reserves um, off the top of your head, would you happen to know what percentage of our reserves that um, $167,000 would be? Uh, President O'Brien, uh, Ms. Orway, uh, I don't have the exact percentage, but it would be less than 1%, I believe, or right at maybe 1%. It, it's a, a very negligible amount. Uh, last I looked at the reserves, I think we're trending um, uh, just over $12 million in reserves. Okay, not that I think that's a big number because we can always use money for um, something um, that's going to come up. But um, when you said recoup the money, perhaps with um, future enrollment, just touch on that briefly and then I'm done and I'll, I'll uh, send any more questions via email. Uh, certainly, uh, President O'Brien, Ms. Ordway, um, one of the things that we think uh, potentially could offset the, um, the $157,000 increase is we might get more participation. So we get, might get more people that elect for this option. And so the, the actual cost wouldn't be $157,000 as we would have. Uh, and, and I should just, for the benefit of maybe uh, the audience online, um, we are self-insured. So uh, the more participation we get, we're distributing that that risk over uh, more premium equivalency in terms of the, the dollars that we collect to be able to have in reserves for any of the claims. So um, we think that uh, if we, we did, the committee asked us to look at uh, what the participation rates were in the four tiers that we offer under the dental plan. And it's not a good proxy for um, for the medical plan because not everybody covers dental and it's not required under the Affordable Care Act. But the participation rates are much higher on the dental plan for employee plus spouse and employee plus children. Um, and so we think that there's a good opportunity for more participation in those two new tiers that we'd be uh, um, recommending for next year. Ms. O'Brien, I have one more quick thing. Um, also, thank you very much for um, not just you, but the committee and those that um, have utilized the wellness points. Um, I see some you know, watches that uh, track steps going around and all sorts of things. And people are not using it as a, oh, wow, look at what, you know, we have this thing that we can join. It is now an integrated um, as part of our culture. And I think that um, when we pay attention to that and we recognize it with future um, incentives, it just shows how important it is that it's not just oh, an option to do but it's kind of the best thing to do for you. So I really do appreciate you guys um, uh, making that a big deal. Thank you. President O'Brien, just you are muted. Thank you, I forgot about that. Mrs. Paperman, do you have any questions? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, I'm just trying to understand from the last uh, review from the budget. So salaries and benefits are combined. So what does it mean that if salary, let's say coverage goes up, then there's no salary increase or the salary increase goes up, uh, uh, benefits uh, go. Yes, yeah, so I'm trying to understand that, like how does that work, like uh, both being combined? Uh, President O'Brien, uh, Ms. Paperman, the the board policy I referenced earlier uh, combines the two together um, as as a uh, benchmark, if you will, against comparable districts. Um, and so, what that does is basically requires us to 
either the benefits or the salaries to be able to uh, keep pace with the uh, how those five comparable districts also choose to spend their dollars. Um, that's what that board policy uh, um, speaks about. The more, so we can increase the benefits um, and that would be an expense related to the labor costs of the district, or we could reduce the benefits um, and increase the salary, or we could increase both of them. Um, so they're, they're both levers that are at our disposal to be able to meet that target um, in policy DBD. Thank you. Mrs. Fisher? I'm good. Thank you. Mrs. Reed? I don't have any questions tonight. Thank you for, for the report and please pass along our thanks to the um, committee for all of their hard work. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you so much, Mr. Miglarino, for that presentation. We'll move on to governing board reports and we will start with Mrs. Paperman. So I would like to thank the, the DBEF 25th Annual Golf Classic uh, for, uh, for uh, doing programs for students, fundings that they have raised for Deer Valley students, teachers, and school. Uh, it was a great experience uh, uh, seeing the process of what they're doing to support our community and our school. Um, and thank you uh, for the presentation today. Uh, and also uh, to the board members uh, for the transparency. Uh, we, we may have disagreement or agreement, but we're here to work together and to support our staff and community. Thank you, Mrs. Paperman. Mrs. Reed. Um, I had the um, opportunity to stop by the golf um, tournament hosted by DBEF um, yesterday. I don't golf, um, so I just went by to um, to say hello and to, to thank the golfers that were there um, before uh, tee off started. Um, so it was great to to see the um, the Deer Valley Education Foundation board and the support that they had um, from everyone, especially during a pandemic. Um, so Marie, I know that you're watching tonight. Um, we would love to hear what the final total was that you raised yesterday. Um, so if you wouldn't mind um, sharing that with us, that would be fantastic. Or uh, cabinet, if somebody knows what, what that amount is, if you wouldn't mind sharing it, that would be great. Um, and I'm a little biased, but um, three of the teachers that were being honored tonight um, for, for a teacher of the year um, were actually my kids' teachers. So I can attest that uh, they really, really deserve that title of teacher of the year. So um, the amount of love and support um, that they show their students, even when they leave their classroom, um, is amazing. So um, I just thank you for everything that um, that you guys do for, for your kids. Thank you for everything that you did for my kids. I know that they're all better students because of the um, dedication that you have to um, to teaching. Um, I wanted to just share a little bit about why I think um, public schools are the, are the best um, with uh, National Public School Week. Um, so when I got involved with advocacy um, a little over five years ago, the biggest striving force in that was the belief that if you want to create stronger and safer communities, you start with your neighborhood school and your neighbor, neighborhood public school, because when people need help, that's where they go. So, um, you know, our schools are the hearts of our community and we know that. Um, and so I'm so thankful for um, that community that our students and our parents and um, our staff members share and that they create day in and day out. Um, I'm a, a proud um, product of public education. I started out in Washington Elementary School District and graduated uh, through Glendale Union High School District. Um, and then I taught in Paradise Valley Unified School District. So um, 
my husband and I, we chose to live in Deer Valley for a reason and um, getting ready to graduate one kid um, through the system, you know, from kindergarten on up and uh, had my stepdaughter go um, through fourth through 10th grade in Deer Valley. Um, there isn't another school district that I would um, want to raise my children in. So um, thank you for everything that um, that you guys do. Um, I hope that um, I know that the people that are watching um, know this, but I hope that our lawmakers understand this, that public education and our public schools provide so much more than education. We are providing food and clothing and um, family support and English classes and um, diagnosing, um, helping to diagnose um, illnesses and disabilities that we see or learning gaps that we see in the classroom. Um, we provide our students with the opportunities um, to be, participate in fine arts and athletics and CTE programs so that we can give them the best foot forward. And I'm so thankful for the opportunities that, um, that my kids have had um, in the public education system. So thank you for everything that each of you do to make um, our neighborhood schools the best that they can be and our district the best that they can be. That's it. Mrs. Fisher. Uh, first, I would like to thank DVEF for yesterday's golf. Um, I very much appreciate the sore shoulder and the sore forehead. Um, and to explain the forehead, um, Phoenix firefighter or fire captain was driving our uh, golf cart. And uh, that was me grabbing hold and sticking my forehead into his shoulder. Um, <laughs> the day was a, a really fabulous event. It really was. It, it has been uh, every year that I've attended. Um, I still can't hit the ball with that little stick, and my team still won't let me bring a softball bat. Um, but it, it is wonderful. It, it really also allowed me to speak a lot with my brother and my sister-in-law, who, who are um, two of the people who uh, were on my team, is that the importance of education for children in general. Um, our focus must always be on our kids. And um, I use my son a lot for, for an example. Um, his original prognosis was, and literally I was told this by the psychologist or psychiatrist, was to institutionalize him and save my family. That he would never he would never fully potty train. He would never um, have uh, any success. And we would probably find that he was going to be retarded and that we should find an institution and put him in it. And I walked into a public school district. Well, I was already in there. He's been in Deer Valley since he was three. And I um, sat down with my IEP team and I said, the psychiatrist says we should find an institution for him. And I'm telling you right now, I select Harvard. Um, and if uh, hopefully you guys will help me get him there. And if I have to settle for a GCC someday or GCU, I will. Um, and I have worked in our special education with our special education teams um, since, since then. And I see the impact that it has had um, and today, my son, I am still, he is still, in, he is still being educated. Um, and that will be something I'll talk about in a moment. But uh, I could not have him here where he is now if I had not had the partnership with the, the staff at Greenbrier or at Highland Lakes or even at Deer Valley um, High School. Because throughout, we have worked together to ensure that, that that student gets forward. So the importance of public schools, regardless of what happens with charters or ESAs or other things, are always, they have to be, we can't, we could never do without our public schools. Um, and I think that's the most important thing. Um, so at the golf tournament, I was able to share a lot of that with, with my, um, my family um, and, and my, our other teammate. Um, but just seeing all the people who come out, the, the smiles and the faces that I have known for years, and they're still in there and they're still working. Um, and especially Marie, I don't know how she gets the, I don't know, energy, gumption 
to do the stuff she does, but how much it benefits our students and our teachers um, and all of us, because I guarantee everyone on this um, meeting has, has had a smile put on their face specifically by her. Um, and so I wanna thank her for, for all that she does. Um, the second thing I, I wanna hit, and that's why I said that it'd be my next thing, um, there's a lot of talks about ESAs, and I've always said that the best way for a public school district to combat things like ESAs or charters is to just make sure that they're the best, um, because then parents will select them. The problem is, and, and um, again, it goes to special needs kids, is if without the ESA programs, we would lose a lot of kids. We saw this in our future study that our special needs kids are falling off after graduation. They're basically falling off at graduation. Um, our statute allows us to um, educate kids to age 22 and receive funding for educating them. Um, in 2015, I presented to Dr. Weitenheimer a, um, some information of what we could do to really assist those students who have reached that 12 month seat time or 12 year seat time, but maybe aren't ready to be in the world. Um, I know that when Ms. Tweedy uh, did, oh, sorry, Dr. Tweedy um, got on the, that sounds weird. When she got on the board, she also shared with Dr. Beitenheimer. And I know that when we hired uh, Dr. Finch, I had um, shared with him some of the thoughts to the extent that I was able to. Um, but that's one area that we have really fallen off in Deer Valley. Um, and and um, I wanna ask that we consider, um, and maybe it is a discussion or a study or something, I don't know. When we address the futures again, is there a reason that our special needs students can't have the rite of passage and not be actually graduated out and have that transition to life and work continue and bring it. Um, and that, that is a greater discussion, but it is something that I would just really request that we at least consider. Um, the future study did show that we did in fact fall off with our special needs kids. Um, and I don't, I know that it's not because we don't care. I think we just don't have the processes in place to honor those um, in that area. Um, and that is why I, when people say, how can you be a, public school supporter and support ESAs. And I explained to them that if it weren't for an ESA, um, I wouldn't be able to provide the additional years of education for my student. Um, so I just I just really hope that we consider that when we're talking about things of, of um, with our legislation and things that are going forward. Um, I think kids need to be first and foremost in everything that we do. Um, and I just don't see a lot of I hear a lot of it's for the kids, but I don't see a lot of it's for the kids sometimes um, when it comes to politics. Um, and that's it. Those are my two topics. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Ordway. Well, everyone's talked about Marie Brennan, so I don't want her head to get too big. So I'll talk about Charlie Philip Peck instead. We didn't get to hear his great speech yesterday. Oops, sorry, Charlie. Um, Jerry Cipriano also and uh, Joe Holcomb play a huge part in that. Um, our teachers of the year, um, you know, yes, they do that. They also do our science, go to science camp. So we all can rule that we never had the opportunity to go and nor will we ever have that opportunity but those kids will because of Marie and such. And I think we're in the middle of, or maybe the end of battle of the books, but I know that that was going on. So public school education, you see sometimes, oh, I wish they had shop back or I wish they had this back. And I write back, no, public education has aircraft maintenance. We have build a house in a hangar from the floor to the HVAC to the electric and out the door, we'll take it to um, Habitat for Humanity. So public education has the opportunity, the responsibility, the access, 
and not always the amount of funding we need, but we make do to um, assist all of the students that we take in, no matter what level they're on, no matter what language they're speaking, or what emotional um, uh, issues that, that they've brought. And that also comes with um, teachers that we have and parents of those students. So we're there for everyone. I think that the impact um, that the ESAs have uh, that were meant only in the beginning for our special needs children with needs that we could not fulfill within the confines of a, uh, of a public school district um, is something that is debatable. Um, but I'd like there to actually be a debate instead of just, you know, send that, that money and not see what the options are. So uh, we agree on things, we don't agree on things, but I think what I've heard all night tonight, more than I've ever heard, uh, or I've heard in a long time is the word student. I don't know if anyone does a word count, but I think we heard student a lot tonight and that um, makes this board member extremely happy. So thank you very much. Everyone that's listening, watching, working, studying, learning, and attending our school district. Thank you, Mrs. Ordway, um, and I will be brief, but I do want Marie Brennan's head to get big. So I am going to once again touch on the Deer Valley Education Foundation's um, golf tournament that was yesterday. It was a great event, a great day. It was great to see some of our um, staff and our supporters and um, all my fellow board members. So uh, I'd like to thank all the sponsors and Charlie Philippic because uh, Deer Valley Education Foundation does do um, awesome things for our students and staff in our district, uh, including tonight they honored the last seven um, teachers of the year, as Mrs. Ordway and Mrs. Reed talked about. And then um, the last thing I'm going to say is that yay public schools. Uh, I went to Deer Valley schools from kindergarten to fifth grade before my family moved a little farther south and I'm a Greenway High School graduate but um, both my kids graduated from Deer Valley and, and truly education is the great equalizer. And, and so I am proud to once again, be part of the Deer Valley Unified School District because I know that we do um, great things for students. And so thank you all to, for all of your hard work and, um, and all that you help our students accomplish and learn and achieve. And with that, Dr. Finch, I'm going to turn it over for the superintendent's report. I too won't uh, join on the Marie party and make her head bigger because she's awesome. We know that, uh, um, but I'll move on to two things I want to mention. Uh, again, uh, thanks again for public school uh, comments and realizing the importance of in our society. The first thing is, as you know, I made a promise to you uh, four years ago now um, that I would visit um, 500 classrooms a year. And I've been able to do that. This year has been a little funky. As you can imagine, I've been to virtual rooms and to physical rooms just past the 500 mark. And this year we decided to go virtual and have the 500 party virtual with uh, Ms. Bautista's uh, kindergartners on DOA. So that was a uh, that was fun. We we got them the Bernstein Bears book, one of the Bernstein Bears books, which are classics. And uh, they got a we also sent a pencil, BUSD pencil in the mail. So they're gonna be all excited to get that. They were jumping up and down literally in their seats when they heard they're getting a, a bear book because the uh, Miss Bautista calls them the Bar the Bautista Bears. So that fit pretty appropriately. And also second thing I want to thank uh, Monica and her team as we had our kindergarten uh, registration drive through last week in our parking lot. We had uh, an astronaut there and a pilot there, as well as a bunch of uh, principals and staff that were um, welcoming parents as they drove through and got their packets. And uh, we have another one coming up, uh, so just check our website. The good news is uh, we're starting to see uh, those numbers tick up, as obviously that won't pay the bills. And as you mentioned, Deer Valley is one of the best, if not the best school district in all of Arizona. So it makes it easy to uh, sell our products. So as uh, more businesses and houses go up in our neighborhood, we want to continue to have Deer Valley as their choice. So thanks again for making Public Schools Week uh, great. Keep tweeting it. Thanks. 
Awesome. Our next meeting um, is March 2nd, but the other future meetings uh, are posted. And with that, I would certainly enter the motion for adjournment. Do you want to hear me making a motion to uh, end the meeting at 9.50 p.m.? Do I have a second? Second. I second. Awesome. Thank you. All those in favor, say aye. I will say aye. 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 At 9.50 p.m. Have a great one, everyone.